Hey folks, welcome to my second instructional video. This is week two, and I'm just gonna click on the course calendar. So by the way, if you're in, if you're just in D2L, you get this menu, and if you click start here, then the last thing on the list is course calendar. So it's pretty easy to get to this inside D2L. And the notebook that we're working on today is notebook three. And of course you have to wait for it to load. I'm gonna pause for just a second here, pause the video. Okay, now it's loaded for me. And by the way, you should take this opportunity possibly to pause the video and load Notebook 3 yourself so that you can do some of these tasks. Um, of course, we want to initialize that first uh, table or two. And they are bringing back the skyscrapers which we have worked with. And let's just ask ourselves a couple of questions as we go through this. First of all, let's ask what this dot select method does. Now I'm going to remind you that we said that dot select was one of the methods. Last time I said it was one of the methods we'd use all the time. And what does it do? It selects a column, which is the name of the skyscraper. So over here, like John Hancock Center. And it's also giving us height. Um, so what is the result going to be? The result is going to be a table with two columns, name and height. And sorry, let me click inside the cell, hit shift enter, and you can see it's just a subset of the table with just these two rows, the ones that we selected. So what does dot select method do? It selects the columns of the table that we want to see, and it's going to extract a new table from the old table that only has the columns that we ask for. Now, I'll admit that we don't use drop all that often, but it's the opposite. In this case, instead of saying select, name, and height, it says to drop the other three columns, and it will do it. It extracts the two columns that we didn't drop. Now, this is interesting to note that the skyscrapers table has not changed. When I do a dot select or a dot drop, I do get a new table, but it leaves the old table unchanged. And so that'll be important that the information is still there. Sometimes we accidentally overwrite the information and it's not still there. Okay, skyscrapers where? I said that dot where was a really important one. Why? Because we specify a variable and then we specify something to look for inside that column. So all of these columns where the city is Los Angeles, it's going to grab Los Angeles skyscrapers. And there we go. And there's one row omitted. Um, people have been asking, so I'll just say that, remember, show with the empty parentheses is the same thing as show all. And it gives us this last one down here. OK. Um, now, this is right in the name column. They're just looking for Empire State Building. So this is just going to go and get the one skyscraper. The one row we asked for was a skyscraper with the name Empire State Building. This one is going to get New York City skyscrapers, right? The where city is equal to New York City and sort based on completed. In other words, it is going to start from the first completed skyscraper. Remember, it will always sort ascending from lowest to highest. So the earliest year is listed first, and these are just New York City skyscrapers. And there are 63 rows omitted, so um, there must be about 73 um, skyscrapers in New York City. Okay, this is the same exact table, except the descending equals true was the optional second term added into the sort. And again, that's if you want the highest values at the top. So these are the most recently completed, 2015, you see 2014 and so forth. So apparently they're still building skyscrapers in New York. These are the Chicago skyscrapers. And then they're gonna do Chicago, right? So notice this, they've 
they've named this new table that was made from skyscrapers using the where method and they've named the new output as the table Chicago then we can use the Chicago table and do where material is steel right so right here for example the material is steel and we're going to sort based on completed and most recently completed goes first all right let's see if we can do that sorry let me shift enter twice and there we go we do get city names of chicago we do get building materials of steel and we do get the most recently completed first okay so that's just a little review of using tables and those important methods remember the four methods that we talk about as being important here i'll just type them while i'm talking right so um the dot where method is important the dot sort method is important the dot select method is important um sorry and what else did we use well, those three are definitely important, and we're going over them. Um, and now we're going to be reminded that the that the computer can actually be used as a calculator, and four plus five is nine. And then what's this? Int. Okay, these are types of variables: int and float. Okay, so float is just a real number. It's a uh, it's not an integer because it's going to have a decimal place. So twenty is just an integer, but twenty divided by nine is a float why well because it has a decimal point and then when it's the answer is actually an integer the division symbol has confused the computer and it thinks it's a real number when in fact it is a real number but it's also an integer um, but it put that 10.0 um, why because it's a float the computer is storing it as a decimal number um, a real number um, and the computer does floating point arithmetic, which is why they're going to call this a float. Now, if you'll scan through here, and I've done this a couple of times, if you scan through this one, there is not a decimal place. So 1.12345678.9 raised to the 50th power um, is just an integer. Now, this um, is 1.23 four five six seven eight nine point zero so entering this has made this number a float um, and it needed to switch to scientific notation let me see I don't even know what will happen if we delete the point zero yep if we delete the point zero we get a big long integer and if we put in the point zero again it tells the computer hey this is a real number this is a number that could possibly have a decimal and so the computer rounds and uses scientific notation right this is scientific notation for um, times 10 to the 161st power okay and this is back to an integer these will be real numbers because they need decimal points in them to display the correct answer now this is interesting do you see this <laughs> it doesn't store the whole number it stops right here i think is where it rounds that seven up because the value to the right of it is five or greater and then it just pauses and you're like wait what okay well there is this uh funny thing about a computer which it can only store so many decimal places these storage locations have a maximum number of bits and bytes that they'll allocate to a storage space and so then you get weird things like this if you execute this cell it says the answer is zero now don't go through there too much but basically the first number has an extra zero one two three four five six seven eight nine and <laughs> so what's happening here well even though these numbers look like they have a lot of digits the computer can only store this many digits and it can store the same number of digits for both numbers both are this one's just slightly longer this one's a lot longer so it thinks they're the same number 
And I know there's not a big difference between the two numbers, but again, there is something here, some positive quantity there, and this should be this answer should be greater than zero. What's going on? The computer has rounding error. Okay, it's going to stop somewhere. It stops at some point and says, "Hey, I'm done. This is all I can store." So so then what happens? Well, what happens is when you come to a code block like this one and you subtract a small number from a small number, um, you can get errors, right? It can't tell the difference between two very small numbers. It thinks the difference is zero. And again, that's due to rounding error. Now, this is the square root of 10, right? 10 raised to the 1 half power is the same as the square root of 10. Um, this is the square root of 16, which is 4. Now, this is interesting. The square root of 10, and then I'm going to square it, right? So inside the parentheses, it says, hey, take the square root of 10. And then it says, hey, take the answer and raise it to the second power. And as we all know, square roots and squaring are inverse operations, so the answer should be 10, right? Wrong. Again, this is that rounding error issue where it's rounded. It's it's taken as many decimal places as it can and, and rounded a little bit and then squared what it had. And so it adds this little bit extra. Why? Well, it's the rounding error of the computer. All right. Um, and so this is just to let you know that can happen. Usually things work like they should. And then they're going to talk about these commands, float and int. And basically what int says is, hey, take a look at what's inside here and make it an integer. Okay, so 20 divided by 10 is going to be 2. And when I put in the int, right, it's going to be um, here, let's do it up here, right? So if I normally, if I did, whoops, sorry, if I did 20 divided by 10, shift enter, it comes out as a float, not an integer, okay? But if I do that calculation inside parentheses, inside this integer command, it will actually turn it into an integer. And 26 divided by 9, well, remember, 27 divided by 9 would be 3, so this is going to be just smaller than 3, Oh, and notice it doesn't round, right? Um, rounding would have caused this number <laughs> to go up to three. What integer does is it just drops the decimal point and everything to the right of it. Okay, now float. So the number three turned into um, float just makes it 3.0. Again, it has... Python shows it as a point zero, just to show you that, yeah, it's it's a float. Okay, it's a float, <laughs> float, and then this one is kind of crazy, not this one. Um, it is what you would expect, a number really, 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 really close to zero. <laughs> so now... We're multiplying a really big number, and I haven't counted all the zeros, so, you know, four quadrillion or however many. And then we're going to multiply that times what? Times a really small number. So now we have a really big number, like four quadrillion, times a really small number, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 56. So that's really close to zero. And what do we get? Well, I'm guessing that there are about 55 zeros here. <laughs> Um, or 56 zeros. Um, why? Because basically all we're getting is four times one and a half, which is six. <clears throat> and this is going the other way. It's taking the six and dividing by the 1.5 e to the minus 56, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 56. And we get this number which is in fact uh, four followed by a decimal place in 56 zeros. Okay, now we're going to variables to remind you. And then this is also just to remind us that we're getting a syntax error. Why? Well, unlike algebra, Python doesn't recognize this as multiplication. I actually have to put the multiplication symbol in there 
x is a number and it can is an integer actually and can be multiplied by 2 and I should get 10 <laughs> but the computer does not recognize algebraic multiplication notation okay now integer y first of all let me just point out for a second that that y is not a number y is the character for its text how do I know it's text because we let Python know by putting quotation marks around a value if it's text so it thinks this is the text uh, character for okay and just to show you let's do y and shift enter and see it's actually putting the quotes down here it's saying yeah I know it's the character for but if I do integer y it takes that character for and turns it into the actual number this is an integer uh, type which is what the integer function does it just takes whatever is in its parentheses and turns it to an integer so for Z you'd think it would turn it into five right it just drops the decimal point and everything to the right and it gives us this stupid error why okay the problem is that even though it's in quotes it's the text five the character five followed by the character decimal place followed by the character six and and integer function is just not able to figure this out okay so it doesn't know exactly what's going on here um, so it can do integer of 5.6 so what we do is we turn this into a real number so let me throw this float 5.6 um and i can even do it if it has quotation marks around it and you'll see that float works fine so after i've floated it into an actual real number then i can do the integer part and get a five where it does throw away everything to the right of the decimal place um, and we can use the round function we've talked about this before and as we said before if i put this number in as a float then the answer will be a float even though it could have been an integer all right so that's just a little bit of review and next we're going to talk about string variable text variables now what's this well notice the quotes around it so it's text 99 bottles of root beer um, these people must have sang the song a little differently than I did when I was a kid and we were singing about 99 bottles of something but okay it should just be text and it puts the quotation marks around it to show us that it's text and 99 again with quotation marks around it is not the number 99 it's the two characters 9 and 9 put together and you can see baby Yoda baby Yoda isn't Yoda and she said hello now notice this actually works out okay all right why and this is why most of the time uh, single quotes and double quotes are um, are synonymous basically they we're, we're allowed to use either one that we want the reason that both of them are allowed are for situations like this where there are quotation marks in the quote and take a look at this this just screws up why because this is a contraction right but it but python thinks it's the end of the text and then it doesn't know what to do with all this stuff okay so here let's try it let's try it with double quotes oops sorry and double quotes which I'll get rid of those okay boom and do you see that now it recognizes that the beginning of the string variable is here and the end is here and then it doesn't interpret this as a quotation mark it it interprets it as a um, as a contraction you know that's it's a symbol that says hey we're doing a contraction um, <laughs> strawberry so it's kind of cool you can add string variables and it concatenates them and what does concatenation mean it just means join together and the way it joins it together is it takes straw and berry and makes the word strawberry and notice that it's still showing it as a string variable so can we do three plus berry and apparently not 
by the way, if I make three a an integer, it will do what we thought it would do, which is three berry. <laughs> but to go back to what they had, three plus berry, it throws an error at us. And then this is straw. This is adding straw plus a space plus berry, which is strawberry with. And so it has this. Sorry, the space between the W and the B. Now, ha times 10. Hopefully you've seen this one that, yes, when I take a string variable and multiply by an integer, then um, I just get 10 copies. Ha, 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 ha. And notice that when I don't multiply by an integer, when I multiply a sequence, right, um, this string variable by 5.5, it actually does not work. Okay, now I can multiply it by 5, for example, and I get LOL, LOL with an O on the end. All right, but notice that I can't do it with a decimal number. All right, I also can't, well, what will happen here? See, it, if it thinks it's a float, even if it's an integer, if the computer thinks it's a float, it can't do this multiplication. Okay, so now we're going to learn about a type of variable called an array. And you've seen these because all the tables we have, all their columns are arrays. Um, so anyway, just to show you, um, it's saying, hey, I've got an array. The array is the text 16 meters and the text 17 meters and the text 18 meters. And it even has this D type, that's the data type. But the key thing here is the word array. Okay, now height item two. Now, wait a second. So we have to make this clear. Okay, the, the computer or Python specifically starts counting at zero. So this is item zero, this is item one, and this is item two. There is no item three in this array. And, as humans, you know, we start counting one, two, three, four, five, right? But the computer doesn't. The computer starts counting at zero. So all I'm trying to say is that when they say the height of item two, uh, height dot item two, it's going to be looking right here. And let's just see if it is. It says it's a string variable. Oh, it says type. Let's just for the moment get rid of that right and see when it when it looks at height item 2 it is looking at the 18 meters and then I can type in type type is the command and it tells me what type of variable this is and yes it's a string variable and I can do type height and it it's same thing it's a little more complicated this ND array out of numpy um, which is actually pronounced NumPy by the computer nerds. Um, and again, NumPy is just a package that does a lot of things like, I mean, it's just weird, but for some reason, Python doesn't know the command average. So we use the NumPy version of average, which you'll see in just a second. Okay, so A equals 10, type A, you're gonna get the type of variable that A is, well, it's an integer. Type of variable that 4.5 is, you're going to get float. Type of ABC, you're going to get string, which it abbreviates STR. Type of skyscrapers, well, it's a table. And it kind of puts it right, it's in the package data science. <laughs> and anyway, so yes, that's a little complicated, but it's true. Now, bool, okay. There is a type of variable that is either true or false. It's used all the time in computer science and it's called Boolean, um, B-O-O-L-E-A-N, Boolean variables, okay? And all it's saying is that, hey, um, this variable is has two possible values, true or false, um, and it's a Boolean variable. Don't worry about that too much. We'll talk about it a little later. All right, type ABS. Well, this is a built-in function or method. Okay, cool. NP round, it's a function. Type uh, round 
If I round 3.4, it rounds down to 3, and that's an integer. And, oh, type NP round. Oh, NP round. Okay. By the way, the two rounding functions are slightly different. The one that's in NumPy um, is slightly different, and so it has a slightly different type of variable. Don't worry about this too much. That's a string variable, and then this will be an integer. Okay, so we we're just going over this section to learn the type of objects that are in Python. And this is not the most important thing to learn, but it will become important as we try to um, have Python do some things for us. We always have to know what, I, what Python thinks is correct. Now, who wants to guess what the command make array does? Well, let's see. Unsurprisingly, make array actually creates an array. And we asked for these four numbers to be in the array, and here they are, they are. Now, what will my array times two do? Well, I executed it so you can see, and you can see it just takes each number and doubles it. So one doubles to two, two doubles to four, three doubles to six, and so forth. Oh, my array raised to the power of two. And it squares everything, right? One squared is still one, two squared is four, right? Three squared is nine, and four squared is 16. Now, what will my array plus one do? And you're right, it's just gonna add one to each component. So instead of one, two, three, four, now we have two, three, four, five. And they're making the point that even though we've done these different commands to my array, the actual value of my array is completely unchanged. And now we're creating another array called another, 60, 70, 80, 90, boom. And then it's like, hey, let's add the original array. Remember, my array is right up here, one, two, three, four. And then the another array is right here. What happens when we add them together? And it adds first component, to first component and gives me 61 and second component to second component is 72 and then 83 and then 94. Okay, so now we have a variable yet another. Notice that it has, sorry, notice that it only has three values in it. So when I add them, it's got this shape conflict one of the arrays has four objects in it, four elements, and one of them only has three, right? So it can't add them together. It can't add my array, which has one, two, three, and four in it, and yet another, which only has three things in it, okay? And then with this zero, that's my class asked me, hey, if I put another uh, element, in the array that only has three, will it add them? And the answer is yes, it'll do just fine. So that's why you saw me delete that just a second ago. But this is how your book, your notebook will look. So they go through a few commands and I would like you to watch these, but they aren't the most important things. Um, len, len, L-E-N is short for length and it just says how, how many elements are in my array. Sum, <laughs> it just adds up all the elements in my array. And then if you'll notice, if I sum up all the elements of my array and divide by the length of my array, that's the actual average, right? The sum of the numbers in the array divided by the number of numbers in the array is actually equal to the average. And then it's saying, hey, what if we just say, take the average of my array? And we get an error. Why? Because it doesn't know what the average is. And you'll notice the little NP, that's the symbol for, we said import NumPy as NP, right? Just so it's easier to type. And now we can actually take the average. So, so Python, if it's guided, knows what average is, but it has to have that NumPy package loaded to know. 
Um, there is another array here. And the length of yet another is three. And then the tunas. And then some the tunas, it can't do that. Right? So it can't take these text variables out of the array and add them as you would hope they could. And there's just another make array command. Okay. This is what I said earlier that, hey, the columns of the tables are array. And notice it's just getting one column and it's asking for the elements out of that column that say San Francisco and then SF. These are the San Francisco skyscrapers from our skyscrapers data set. And we've extracted SF as a table so we can use methods on SF. And we just selected the height column out of that table. And then notice that we use the dot column method to do what? To pull this array of numbers out of here. Why would we do that? Well, notice that we're multiplying all of the meters, the heights heights are in meters and so we're multiplying by 3.28 which is the number of feet per meter and then we're adding a new uh, column to the table now do you need to know how to do this no but it is helpful to know that hey we can do a little math and then add another column to our table all right and the san francisco table has not changed okay and san francisco column three remember what we said right that the that python starts counting at zero so this first column is zero and then one and then two and then three so if we say sf column three we don't have to use the names we can just call the numbers but we have to remember that python starts counting at zero so zero one two and three and same thing if we want the material we can just put column one and it pulls the material that it was built out of if we want completed i think that's column four and remember that if we want the names that's column zero boom and it does give us the names and why do we do this because if i use the dot column method i pull this column out as an array and then I can use something like average on it and so the average height of skyscraper in San Francisco is about 226 point 226 and a half meters okay now notice they're doing the LA dot show everything remember show with the parentheses empty is like show all so now we're looking for skyscrapers where the city is Los Angeles and we enter it and yay they're all there and notice that it's taking the column from the LA skyscrapers and excuse me the height column from the LA skyscrapers and the height column from the San Francisco skyscrapers it's taking the average of both and subtracting them so what's the difference well the LA skyscrapers on average are about 4.625 meters taller than the San Francisco skyscrapers. So again, this is why we want to be able to use why why we want why we need dot column is to get a column out of a table and be able to do math with it. Um, and we see that the average height for the LA skyscrapers is 231. Now we're creating an NY table, which is the table of New York skyscrapers, and there are 63 rows omitted, so there are 70 some skyscrapers in New York. And now we're going to take the average New York skyscraper height as a column. The dot column makes it into an array, so I can take its average. And we're going to compare the New York average to the LA average. Boom. And New York skyscrapers on average are 5.315 or 316 
meters taller than LA skyscrapers. <laughs> now this is funny, not NY are the skyscrapers where you look at the city column and you take everything R dot not equal to New York City. And notice the underscores, they're hard to remember. They're also hard to say when you're talking about it. And if we showed everything, you could go down here and you would see that there are New York, no New York City skyscrapers. And then here's only LA and NYC, and that's where city, now this is interesting, this is a different predicate that we've used before. It says r.contained in. So if the city name is contained in Los Angeles, New York City, it will pull it out. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to get all the LA and all the New York City skyscrapers. And notice it is grabbing LA size skyscrapers and it is grabbing uh, New York City skyscrapers. So that's pretty cool. The R contained in predicate is pretty cool. And then R not contained in. So this is, I want all the skyscrapers that aren't in LA and are not in New York City. And boom. And again, they've got Atlanta and they've got Chicago and Houston and Las Vegas, but they don't have any LA or New York City. Um, the length of NY column, ny dot column three is 73. Okay. And then it's also showing I can do that using the number of rows of table, using a table method that we learned, num rows, 73. It's the same thing either way. I can either pull it out as a, as an array and apply the len command to it, which is length, and it'll tell me it's got 73 elements in it, or you can say, how many rows does it have? And it says, I have 73 rows. Okay. And then the skyscraper where city is Chicago, number of rows, you can see there are 36 skyscrapers in that table. Okay, so don't worry too much um, about how to make these graphs. Um, <laughs> this is just a dot plot of the different graphs. And let's try to figure out what the dark blue are. Oh, so the red are New York. And the dark blue are LA. Okay. And we are comparing their heights. Oops, sorry, I was trying to point over here. Where I have to get a pen and show, right? The height is on the vertical axis and the year completed is on the horizontal axis and it's just a scatter plot. Nice, okay. Here is a box plot that compares the two. So you can see the New York City skyscrapers over here on the left and the LA skyscrapers over on the right. And notice New York City has more outliers um, than LA skyscrapers. And again, these are the box plots that compare the two. We just looked at this. Nice graph. And now we are going to look at a bar graph. Notice that the count Descending equals true. So what we're looking at, we're looking at the number of skyscrapers in New York City, the number in Chicago, the number in Houston, Los Angeles, Atlanta, all the way down to, you know, these cities like Atlantic City and Austin and Cincinnati, which have a very few number of skyscrapers. Um, so this is getting the cities, only the cities that have more than five total skyscrapers. All right, so Atlanta counts, um, and Miami it looks like has less than Atlanta, but is still uh, still five, uh, more than five, Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, and New York City. Okay, what's this gonna do? It's the same thing, except you'll see that the sort Right now, they're sorted based on city, right? Atlanta is first. Why? Because it starts with an A. And they do the sort slightly differently. Now they're going to sort based on count. 
and it doesn't look the same, right? It goes least to greatest. Now they're going to add the descending equals true, which is gonna reverse it and go from greatest to least, which looks like this. Okay, then what does this one do? Okay, this is back to sorting based on city, where Atlanta being starting with an A is first and everything else follows in alphabetical order. And the final thing that we're gonna talk about is ranges, okay? Why? Well, make array works like this, right? It just adds those six numbers. Um, and let me just show you, this is not the word arrange. The word arrange has two R's in it. And you're like, okay, you're being very picky. <laughs> yes, I am. Sorry about that. It's the command a range, right? And it comes from the NumPy package. And what does it do? It starts counting at zero and it goes up until one less than the number I put here. So it's, it does do six things, but it starts at zero. So it stops counting at five. NPA range seven is gonna be the same thing, but it's gonna stop at six. NPA range from three to nine is gonna start counting at three and go up until one less than nine. Now notice this with the third parameter in it, minus one, it's gonna count down from 15 to seven. Why? Well, excuse me, 15 to eight. Why? It always stops one before this number. Okay, now look at this. This is gonna get the even numbers between one and 21. So that's gonna be two, four, six, eight, right? Weird. This is not count only multiples of two. This is start counting here and go up to one less than this, but count by twos, right? So one, three, five, seven. I'm adding two each time and notice that I stop before the 21. Now what's this gonna do? This should be even numbers, right? And it'll stop at 20, one less than the number here. And then what the heck is NPA range gonna do if I count by 0.01? It actually will count by 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, and so forth all the way up to one less than the 1.01. .01. So it stops at 1.0. Um, NPA range seven, we already talked about this. It starts counting at zero and it counts up to one less than the seven. So there it is. A dot item six. Okay, is that gonna be five or six? It's gonna be six, why? Well, it starts counting at zero. <laughs> so when it gets up to six, it's actually there. Item zero is going to be zero. And B, item 49. Again, this is the 49th entry in this array, which the computer is telling us is 0 0.41, uh, 0 0.49, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is how you work with arrays um, and very cool. And remember the A range command, uh, which is really helpful. And so I'll be back either later today or tomorrow with another video that's going to be a help video about how to take the chapter quizzes. And I hope you have a great day.